Thanks for joining me at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences. I'm your host, Professor and Chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences, John Cook, uh, and I'm joined today uh, by some great guests who are going to be talking to us about inflammatory signaling and cardiovascular regeneration. Inflammation plays a critical role in cardiovascular regeneration repair, which is what we're going to learn about today from Professor Nicholas Franco Yanis uh, from Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, thank you for joining us, Professor Franco Yanis. Where uh, I understand that uh, there you are, the uh, professor of medicine and also immunology, uh, and uh, you're t you have a chair, the Edmund J. Safra Republic National Bank of New York Chair in Cardiovascular Medicine, uh, where you do. Uh, your research in myocardial injury and cardiac fibrosis, and you're going to be talking about your work with inflammation and cardiac repair. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, John. It's a great pleasure to, to join. And uh, we'll be joined also by two of our rising stars in the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences uh, here at Houston Methodist Research Institute. Uh, Dr. Xu Meng uh, is uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences. Uh, she got her PhD at Temple, uh, and then she joined us here in Houston. Also, we have Dr. Li Lai. Uh, Lily joined us from Shanghai. She was there uh, getting her PhD in biomedical sciences and uh, came to do her postdoc uh, with us at the uh, Department of Cardiovascular Sciences, and then uh, has continued on to become a junior faculty member. Um, well. Inflammation has a bad rap in cardiovascular. Uh, to be sure, it plays an important role in atherosclerosis and in vascular diseases. However, inflammation also plays a role in cardiovascular repair, doesn't it, Dr. Frank Um Yes, it does. And uh, um, in fact, uh, I think we can start with uh, my first slide, which uh, starts dealing with uh, uh, these uh, concepts. Uh, so, um, as you can see in this slide, uh, unfortunately, evolution did not uh, endow us with a gift of uh, cardiac regeneration. So, the adult heart in humans and also in all mammals heals uh, through an inflammatory response. It heals by forming a collagen-based scar. What you can see in this slide is uh, the transition through the three different phases of repair following infarction the inflammatory phase during which inflammatory leukocytes infiltrate the myocardium, uh, they phagocytose dead cells and matrix debris, and they set the stage for the proliferative phase during which cells involved in repair, fibroblasts and vascular cells, form granulation tissue and the deposit matrix, which becomes now replaces the dead cardiomyocytes and becomes an important part of the structure of the ventricle, so preserves the structure of the ventricle following an event like infarction. So repair of the infarcted heart is dependent on inflammation. However, it is well recognized that uh, too much of inflammation uh, can be detrimental for the injured heart. So excessive inflammation, uh, either prolonged or expanding in areas where uh, there is no substantial injury, or just uh, accentuated inflammation is associated with adverse remodeling and with heart failure. But on the other hand, also impaired inflammation impairs healing and causes complications such as cardiac rupture or adverse events that may also lead to heart failure. So you need just the right amount of inflammation and just the right composition of cellular profiles of cells and molecular signals in the area of injury to have optimal healing. May I have the next slide, please? So uh, inflammatory cells in, uh, infiltrate the myocardium following myocardial infarction and participate in healing. And although uh, lymphocytes, dendritic cells, mast cells are also known to contribute, the predominant inflammatory cells are macrophages. Infarct macrophages are diverse. They have uh, uh, distinct transcriptomic profiles by doing single cell transcriptomics, we have now realized that uh, there are several subclassifications of uh, macrophages in the infarcted heart. 
And uh, these uh, transcriptomic profiles may correspond to the different functional profiles that we see in the infected heart. So macrophage subsets have been implicated in uh, phagocytic responses, in pro-inflammatory responses, in anti-inflammatory responses, so in suppressing inflammation during resolution of the inflammatory response, in fibrogenic responses and geogenic responses. There have been suggestions that uh, macrophages in the infected heart may have cytoprotective actions and could even, uh, even promote regeneration in some cases. May I have the next slide, please? Fibroblasts are also a major cell type involved in repair of the infarcted heart. And much like macrophages, fibroblasts are also very diverse. They're functionally and phenotypically diverse. And also they change their phenotype as we transition through the three different phases of infarction. So during the inflammatory phase, the fibroblasts may serve as inflammatory cells, may secrete cytokines and chemokines, and also produce proteases that degrade the extracellular matrix. Then during the proliferative phase, they change their phenotype. They become secretory myofibroblasts, producing matrix proteins that repair the injured heart. And also they express contractile proteins and are responsible for wound contraction. May I have the next slide, please? And, you know, I guess at this point, I'd like to ask you a question, uh, Dr. Frango It uh, What you've told us is that inflammation is important in cardiovascular repair and uh, that there are subsets of macrophage that participate in the repair process and there's a subset of fibroblasts that participate in this process. How, how do f have you dis differentiated between these different subsets? What methods do you use to differentiate? Um, the, the optimal methodology, the cutting edge methodology uh, in the current era is uh, single cell transcriptomics. So uh, using single cell RNA-seq, we can identify specific clusters of macrophages and fibroblasts with distinct transcriptomic profiles. The problem is that the single cell transcriptomics does not give, do not give us information on the functional properties of these cells. So for, for this, uh, what we do is uh, we perform genetic manipulations that uh, knock down specific genes in fibroblasts and macrophages. And we realize that uh, only subsets of these cells are responsible for activation of a certain uh, pathway that leads to angiogenic response, that leads to a fibrogenic response, that leads to a pro-inflammatory response. So typically the combination of single cell transcriptomics and some functional study gives us the information which is necessary to suggest that there is uh, this diversity of macrophage phenotypes and fibroblast phenotypes. Also flow cytometric studies using the relatively limited approaches that we have to differentiate these uh, cell types with uh, specific markers can also serve to distinguish subsets of macrophages or subsets of fibroblasts based on their known biological properties from other models or from in vitro uh, models. Polarized phenotypes that may develop in vitro, for example, is something that we may be recapitulated to some extent in the in vivo context. Beautiful. Well, let's go on with your presentation. Thank you for that response. May I have the next slide, please? So um, fibroblasts exhibit a remarkable diversity in injured hearts. Injury triggers expansion of fibroblast populations and also amplifies their pre-existing diversity in the normal tissue. They exhibit distinct transcriptomic profiles and also uh, a diverse range of functions serving as inflammatory cells, serving their main function, which is matrix synthesis and remodeling. But also they have been suggested to serve angiogenic roles and cytoprotective uh, actions. So all these functions may be due to distinct subsets of fibroblasts. May I have the next slide, please? There are two contrasting views on uh, uh, the cellular, on the basis for the cellular diversity in tissue repair. Uh, one view suggests that there are polarized phenotypes. So uh, phenotypes of cells which uh, show 
a certain profile, transcriptomic, proteomic profile, and very distinct properties. This is like the M1, M2 concept for macrophages, M1 macrophages being pro-inflammatory, M2 macrophages being pro-fibrotic, express distinct uh, profiles of cytokines. The other uh, pattern of cellular diversity that has been suggested is uh, more of a palette of more new, a palette of nuanced profiles. So each cell has a distinct profile. It's like uh, an individual. It has its own characteristics. But uh, the, these cells, the, those, this chaotic diversity of cells can be subclassified into clusters of cells with some uh, properties, with some shared properties. Which one of the two models is correct? Probably the palette is closer to the real situation. Uh, cells have uh, their own identity, but uh, also uh, considering the need that we have as humans to understand this process, just relying on bioinformatics to understand what these cells would do is impossible if we assume that each cell is different from every other cell. Thus, we borrow the concepts of the polarized phenotypes to be able to put some order into that chaos of cellular diversity. May I have the next slide, please? Another concept that is prominent in the cell biology of repair is cellular plasticity. So in every healing wound, and the infarct is no exception to that, cells rapidly change their phenotype and function in response to microenvironmental changes. So these changes expand the functional and phenotypic diversity of the inflammatory and the reparative cells. And because repair requires many different cellular responses, it requires the wound to be cleared from dead cells, it requires matrix to be degraded and then deposited, it requires new vessels to be formed. This expansion of cellular diversity is critical for effective healing. So this cellular plasticity is very important for repair. And uh, it has been suggested that it may evolve even dramatic changes in the phenotypic of char characteristics of the cells, leading to their transformation to a completely different cell type. Examples of plasticity are shown below. So in fibroblasts, you have uh, from uh, one uh, part of the spectrum, the myofibroblast, the activated myofibroblast on the right that expresses a lot of matrix proteins, has uh, stress fibers, and on the other hand, the quiescent fibroblast that uh, has uh, resembles has more of a dendritic morphology, uh, does not have uh, stress fibers, and expresses relatively low amounts of uh, of uh, collagen. Uh, however, it has been suggested that cells like fibroblasts may transdifferentiate to other cell types, and also the origin of fibroblasts may involve other cell types. So it has been suggested that macrophages other, progeni other uh, circulating progenitor cells, uh, pericytes, smooth muscle cells, and endothelial cells can convert into fibroblasts. May I have the next slide, please? This field is particularly contentious, and uh, uh, I will focus on an example uh, showing the conflicting evidence that uh, the literature provides us. Uh, so it has been suggested that fibroblasts can convert to endothelial cells in the injured heart contributed to angiogenesis. There is evidence uh, that was introduced uh, uh, by Arjun Debs' uh, lab uh, in a paper in Nature in 2014, uh, suggesting that uh, fibroblasts uh, transdifferentiate to endothelial cells through a process called MNDOT, and they may participate in angiogenesis. The graph is from uh, a paper of uh, one of uh, Arjun's uh, trainees. The, the cartoon and uh, uh, this concept uh, was supported by some investigators but then uh, a few years later a study by Bin Zhao from uh, Shanghai uh, suggested that uh, no uh, all endothelial cells in the infarct are derived from other endothelial cells and uh, they used uh, several different free lines and several different methods to label fibroblasts and endothelial cells to dismiss the suggestion, the notion that uh, fibroblasts may, trans may transdifferentiate into endothelial cells. So conflicting views, but uh, why do, do we have these conflicting views? May I have the next slide, please? Uh, 
And uh, the answer relates to the methodology used to support these concepts and the, to test uh, this uh, hypothesis. Uh, these methodologists have major limitations. It's uh, a major challenge to visualize the fate of a cell in vivo. So what uh, we use to achieve that information is uh, uh, studies in genetically manipulated mice. So we perform uh, techniques uh, uh, which are called the lineage tracing techniques. Uh, thus, uh, we develop uh, uh, a mouse uh, in which uh, we can trace the cells we are interested in. An example is shown here where uh, a mouse uh, expressing a priori combinase under control of a cell-specific promoter is uh, crossed with a mouse that has, uh, under the control of the ROSA26 uh, locus, a stop codon and uh, followed by a fluorochrome, in this case, uh, TD tomato. So both these mice uh, are healthy, they have no uh, problems, and also they do not have any differences from normal mice. But if you cross them together, you have uh, the opportunity, uh, if you inject these mice uh, with uh, the agent that will activate the Cree expression, like tamoxifen, uh, to, uh, to excise the stop codon, in which case the cells that express the Cre will uh, uh, be uh, fluorescent, will become uh, fluorescent, and uh, also their derivatives will become fluorescent. So you will have labeled these cells and you will be able to follow them throughout the biological process that you are interested in. And an example is shown below uh, showing how we, uh, and this is from our lab, uh, how we uh, I, I, that how we label uh, pericytes with an NG2, an inducible NG2 promoter, and how uh, we attempt to examine whether pericytes become fibroblasts using a marker for fibroblast PDGF receptor alpha. So these combinations of lineage tracing techniques with uh, a labeling approach is the main strategy that we use, which can be coupled in some cases with single cell transcriptomics. However, these uh, strategies have all limitations. So the technique that we're using is as good as the pre-driver and as specific as the good pre-driver that we're using to label the cells of interest. If uh, the uh, cell-specific promoter is not truly specific for the cell of interest, then of course, we're not going to detect specifically the cells that we're interested in. And then if the methods we're using to label our cells lack specificity, then also we're going to have problems in uh, identifying uh, the process of interest. So uh, overall, the discrepancies are often due to the fact that uh, these techniques have flaws and there are no specific markers for the cells of interest that the investigators are studying. May I have the next slide, please? So it is not surprising that uh, there is uh, that there are conflicting there is conflicting evidence in this field. However, most people would agree that uh, uh, the cells in injured tissues exhibit some degree of uh, plasticity, and they can tra be transformed from one phenotype to the other. So, which molecular signals can trigger plasticity in these cells? Which is a major component of the cellular diversity that uh, uh, we observe in healing wounds. It's the signals which are released from damaged, necrotic, injured cells. And uh, there is a category of uh, mediators, which uh, we characterized as uh, danger signals, uh, uh, damage associated molecular patterns, DAMPs, which include HMGB1, uh, cellular RNAs, HSPs, interleukin-1-alpha, also an important one, fragments from the damaged cellular matrix. So it's not just cellular components that participate in this process. And uh, these mediators uh, uh, bind to receptors on the cell surface of every cell type involved in tissue repair. They induce inflammation and they have been implicated in damage, in uh, extending damage of the heart but they also play a role in repair. They may activate fibroblasts. Uh, they may be even involved in regeneration. And uh, may I have the next slide, please? And this has been uh, a major priority for uh, cardiovascular research. Um, cardiac regeneration has truly been over the last uh, 20 years, 
the holy grail of uh, cardiovascular research. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we have been uh, as successful in this as uh, the heroes of uh, the Monty Python movie in achieving their goal. Uh, after 20 years and uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, spent uh, in this direction, unfortunately, we have not achieved uh, a, a positive result in regenerating uh, the myocardium. Would we optimize immune-mediated cell transformations to achieve myocardial remuscularization? Is that a viable approach? Is that something that could be likely to produce positive results? May I have the, the next slide, please? Unfortunately, the studies in adult animals and all the genetic manipulations that have been performed in adult animals have failed to produce uh, true remuscularization. However, there are some situations and specific models that can be used to infer effects of immune cells that may trigger uh, remuscularization and the cardiac regeneration. And one such situation is the neonatal heart. In the neonatal mouse heart, for a few days after birth, the mice retain the regenerative capacity that uh, the embryonic uh, part uh, also has. And this is a model that uh, Sham Sadek uh, developed uh, with others at uh, UT Southwestern, where they excise the apex of the mouse heart and uh, they observe regeneration uh, when uh, this is performed in the first uh, few days uh, after birth. The model is an excellent model, but it requires uh, uh, a lot of uh, careful standardization because even minor differences in uh, the extent of initial injury can greatly affect the degree to which uh, the, the heart can regenerate. Based on this model, there has been work, and this is a paper representative of this work uh, by Eric Olson's group, uh, suggesting that immune cells are required for neonatal heart regen regeneration. Uh, the uh, one issue with this paper is that uh, it's unlikely that macrophages would be sufficient for this process, because uh, it seems that the main function of macrophages in this model was uh, to ensure that uh, there is appropriate uh, induction of an angiogenic response. They did not seem, uh, at least the authors could not uh, identify direct effects on uh, neonatal cardiomyocyte growth, uh, proliferation, and remuscularization. Uh, thus, it's unclear whether macrophages or any other immune mechanisms are sufficient to promote uh, regeneration, or they are one of the many parts of many pieces which are required in order to remuscularize the, uh, the, the injured heart. May I have the next slide, please? So what do we need for the future? And uh, uh, what uh, questions do we need to answer in order to improve repair of the infarcted heart and possibly to move to the next uh, uh, to the solution to the problem of uh, cardiac regeneration? Uh, some important questions. Are cell conversion events prominent in the injured mammalian heart? And uh, despite the fact that uh, we have uh, many studies showing cell transformation, uh, one problem with these studies is that uh, they have focused uh, predominantly in generating a newsworthy uh, finding, uh, a novel uh, finding, rather than uh, looking at the totality of uh, uh, the events that occur to generate a specific cell type. So. Uh, more, quite often, the goal is to show that the one cell can transdifferentiate to another cell, not what the significance of this uh, transdifferentiation is in uh, uh, the generation of new vessels or in the population, in the expanding population of fibroblasts. Second important question, what is required to activate the cardiac regenerative program? Um, what the information we have obtained from uh, neonatal hearts suggests that uh, there are many different components which are required, but probably none of them is by itself sufficient. So perhaps the reason why the neonatal heart regenerates re relates to uh, distinct neonatal phenotypes of many different cell types. So both immune cells, but also uh, cardiomyocytes and vascular cells and fibroblasts and the matrix have some unique characteristics in the neonatal heart that we have not yet been able to decipher. 
Uh, third question, do distinct immune signals activate fibrogenic versus regenerative responses in the injured heart? So uh, could we perhaps identify a specific uh, pattern recognition uh, receptors that uh, promote uh, regenerative response uh, or uh, others that promote the fibrogenic response, a predominantly fibrogenic response? And perhaps is there a role, uh, a negative role, for a fibrogenic response in inhibiting the regenerative response, which may have uh, been an obstacle up till now in achieving regeneration in uh, mammalian hearts. Important question, can we manipulate such signals to induce uh, uh, regeneration? Uh, finally, from the practical viewpoint, uh, one could question whether the challenges posed by cardiac regeneration are uh, truly insurmountable. and. Uh, uh, whether we should uh, rather focus on uh, uh, a goal that is a bit more modest uh, but achievable to optimize the scar and uh, reduce adverse remodeling. And I know that this sounds uh, pessimistic. Uh, however, uh, if you consider the needs uh, for uh, all the requirements for uh, generating functional myocardium, these uh, are not limited to just generating a few cardiomyocytes, a few independent uh, contractile cardiomyocytes, but require a network of uh, cardiomyocytes, uh, uh, some macrophages, uh, vascular cells for perfusion, some, uh, some uh, uh, fibroblasts, uh, a specific profile of matrix, and then an electrical activity that uh, uh, propagates uh, uh, without uh, uh, creating re-entry re circuits. So all this is particularly demanding and it may not be uh, uh, possible with the current technology that we have. Uh, what I'm sure about uh, is that uh, we need to keep trying. And uh, in every one of us, uh, we need to have uh, uh, the dreams and the ideals of a Don Quixote ready to advance forward with our dreams and our goals, but also at the same time, the logical approach, the down to earth approach of a Sancho Pancha to balance these ideals. And with these thoughts, I complete my presentation. Oh, that was you. beautiful, Dr. Franco Giannis. Uh, really uh, insightful and uh, a nice summary of what, where we are and uh, posing some questions of where we need to go. Uh, thank you for that. We're going to have a little discussion about what you just told us, but I was reminded to tell everyone that um, online that uh, you can participate in the discussion if you'd like uh, by texting DeBakey, that's D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, to 37607, and then you can text your message. Uh, or you can join by web, and uh, that uh, go to pollev, that's P O L L E V dot com, enter DeBakey, D E B A K E Y, and uh, respond. Uh, so I think that's showing now what, what you can do to participate in the discussion. Well, um, Dr. Franco Giannis, um, I, th I thought uh, your concept that perhaps it, a population of cells that compose an organ. Um, it, the the uh, a population of fibroblasts that are within an organ, they, they represent a palette of cells that have different phenotypes uh, and uh, in responding to disease can respond differently. I thought that was a really beautiful idea. You want to talk a little bit more about what, what is the evidence for a palette versus a predisposition to one phenotype versus the other? Yes, uh, and... Um, uh... A lot of this is speculative, so that's why I presented uh, the two different models. So on one hand, uh, you have uh, the, the palette of colors, and on the other hand, you have the polarized phenotypes. Uh, so in uh, our thinking is aided by considering both of them. But the reason why I think uh, it uh, is more likely, much more likely, that uh, a palette is closer to reality is uh, single cell transcriptomics. So in um, single cell transcriptomic uh, studies, um, it, there seems to be a, a diversity of cells, each one of them with uh, different transcriptomic profiles, but uh, cells that we cluster, we cluster though on them on the basis of uh, some shared characteristics. Identical cells we do not find, so they have nuances of the uh, of uh, the same color, 
but we can distinguish cells with some shared characteristics. We do not see uh, identical cells uh, belonging into two or three or four polarized groups as the polarized phenotype uh, uh, model would, uh, would suggest. Um, in a similar manner, uh, it's uh, also, it's not just the transcriptomic study that suggests that, but also uh, studies, uh, uh, exam proteomic uh, studies, so uh, concepts uh, derived from uh, polarized uh, uh, differentiation of cells uh, in vitro, uh, such as the M1 versus M2 model, which are uh, induced macrophages uh, uh, through uh, the effects of uh, specific uh, uh, cytokines, uh, they do not really exist in vivo, at least not in the same way. So we cannot identify these very specific types of cells with uh, uh, almost a prescriptive profile of mediators that would correspond to an M1 versus M2 uh, polarization. Instead, we find those mixed phenotypes uh, those nuanced phenotypes which, with uh, different properties. And we are trying to classify them on uh, the basis of uh, uh, functional characteristics. So they may not have the same identical transcriptomic profiles, but uh, if they have profiles that resemble and would be expected to promote a specific function, angiogenesis, fibrosis, then they probably should be clustered together. So that is uh, the uh, the, what we're using, try to put some order into that chaos of diversity, which is suggested by the, uh, the, the transcriptomic uh, analysis, by the big data approaches like uh, single cell RNA-C. We just got a, a question from uh, the audience. Uh, what do you think about the role of cell senescence in regeneration? What role does senescence play? So, um, in um, uh, senescent animals, uh, and uh, this has an impact in uh, senescent uh, humans, um, the experimental models have suggested that there is an impaired reparative response. Um, the uh, characteristics of a scar in a, a senescent mouse, uh, and uh, this is a pure model of uh, aging because uh, uh, in uh, humans, uh, senescence is typically associated with uh, diseases as well. So senescent humans have a higher incidence of uh, many uh, other diseases. It's much more difficult to study. But in, uh, in the mouse model, which is a pure model of aging, what uh, we had observed is that uh, uh, there is an impairment of uh, fibroblasts to uh, deposit matrix. And uh, importantly, these fibroblasts will, were less responsive uh, to growth factors such as mm -hmm. uh, TGF beta. In a similar manner, there is a senescence of uh, the immune system, and um, uh, there is a baseline activation of uh, low level inflammation, but an inability to mount an intense inflammatory response like mm -hmm. a younger organism the, would this, achieve. The so called, so how, the so -called how inflammaging, inflammaging uh, phenotype. Yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, and, uh, but also with, with a defective response to injury. So uh, a, a level of inflammation at baseline accompanied by an inability to mount uh, a robust inflammatory and reparative response uh, following injury. And uh, that uh, uh, may explain the increased uh, uh, incidence of adverse remodeling in aging populations because uh, having an impaired reparative reserve, uh, fewer active reparative cells that uh, can uh, infiltrate the myocardium and produce the matrix that is needed, results in uh, a reduced tensile strength of the wound and perhaps in more adverse remodeling. Mm -hmm. uh, thus, these responsive to, responses to growth factors, impaired responses to growth factors, I think it's something that is uh, observed uh, generally in aging uh, organisms mm -hmm. and uh, may have a major impact in uh, uh, repair and in healing uh, of, uh, of, of the heart as well. We've got a few more questions that have come up, but just very briefly perhaps, uh, tell us, um, you mentioned the, the different populations and, uh, of macrophage, and someone asked the question, well, there's M1 versus M2, what other subsets are there? Uh, 
Yes, so the, uh, the way to uh, categorize them would be on a functional basis. Um, so the nuances, the transcriptomic uh, uh, profiles should be coupled with uh, uh, functional cat categorization of macrophages. So in vivo, uh, I would not recognize M1 versus M2 macrophages. We sometimes do that in uh, experimental studies because uh, we have limited tools in uh, uh, identifying macrophage populations. So the M1 uh, uh, phenotype, uh, especially if we enrich the typical marker, surface marker or INOS with uh, cytokine profile study has some relevance and potentially some functional implications. But the most pertinent classification would be on the basis of function. So we should uh, identify them as fibrogenic macrophages and geogenic macrophages. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, regenerative macrophages, if there is uh, such a subset, yeah. inflammatory macrophages, phagocytic, regulatory macrophages, rather than anti-inflammatory is a term that is typically so used. So I guess, I guess what you're saying is it's a lot more complex than simply M1, which is the old pro-inflammatory category, versus M2, which is the immunomodulatory regenerative capacity. There's a lot of different forms of macrophage that have slightly different functions based on their transcriptional profile. We're, we're exactly. going to come back to that, uh, but let's move on because we have uh, two more speakers. I'd like to get to Xu uh, Meng because Xu's done some work that's uh, related to what you were talking about, Dr. Franco, Franco Giannis. Um, may I have the next slide, please? Um, so, um, while we've been doing some parallel work to yours, Dr. Franco Giannis, um, the, related to the role of inflammation and epigenetic plasticity, and essentially what we find, and uh, others uh, as well have found, is that um, activation of these pattern recognition receptors on a cell that can recognize damage. You mentioned the damage associated molecular patterns stimulating infl inflammation. Uh, so these damage-associated molecular patterns uh, stimulate pattern recognition receptors that lead to inflammatory signaling, leading to the release of cytokines and chemokines. That's well described. What we found is that there also is an alteration in the chrominin of the nucleus so that the chrominin basically opens up so that the cell can become uh, reach back into its genetic toolbox and pull out whatever it needs to survive or adapt. So the basis of plasticity, we think, is uh, the basis of plasticity is this uh, open chrominin conformation that is induced by inflammatory signaling. And with that open chrominin conformation, uh, one can get an alteration in, in cellular phenotype uh, in response to whatever is going on in the environment. So I think um, Dr. Xu Meng is going to talk a little bit about her work with uh, fibroblast to endothelial cell transdifferentiation and the role of inflammatory signaling in that process. Go ahead, Xu. Thank you, Dr. Cook. So, sorry, I cannot see the screen. Um, so our lab have previously reported a transdifferentiation of fibroblasts to endothelial cells using small molecule based method. Um, so, with this 28 day protocol uh, with poly IC to activate innate immunity followed by endothelial cell developmental cytokines, we could be able to obtain 2% of CD31 positive cells from EG fibroblast. And we term this um, CD31 positive cells induced endothelial cells, IECs. Um, Next slide, please. And then we have fact sorted these um, IEC populations and found that these cells are transcriptionally and functionally very similar to human mature endothelial cells. Uh, in the left panel, uh, shows you the RNA-seq data that the IECs has a transcriptional profile very similar to human mature endothelial cells, while very uh, quite different from their parental fibroblast at the first column. Um, and then later figure shows you that uh, the IECs could uptake acylated LDL, um, they could form tube cell matrigel, uh, they release nitric oxide, 
and secrete angiogenic cytopens to the level that is similar to human endothelial cells. Uh, still, the question we want to ask is whether um, trans differentiation of fibroblasts to endothelial cells could happen in vivo uh, and whether in any new activation could promote this precise. So the tools we use are the uh, fibroblast specific linear tracing mice, the FSP1 create uh, user 26 YP mice. Um, and also we use matrix gel plug assay. Uh, so in this assay, we mix the matrix gel with polyacy to activate innate immunity or androgenic agents or their combination and inject it subcutaneously into the fibroblast linear tracing mice. And we dissected the matrix gel plugs uh, for further analysis. As shown in figure A, um, the gross morphology shows that a waste poly IC and the uh, endocytal cytokine together is significantly promoted uh, vascular regeneration uh, and uh, there's uh, uh, abundant angiogenesis as shown in figure A and as shown in figure B uh, in the histone, uh, AG staining. And importantly, we also show that uh, the, in this group, there's significantly increased trans differentiation as shown in the top right quadrant in figure D. So these data suggest that TAL3 activation and endothelial cytokines promote trans differentiation. So next slide, please. Um, we further tested uh, this concept in the Heller ischemia model. And so in this model, uh, as shown in figure E, we performed um, femoral artery ligation uh, in the mouse hand limb and observed the blood flow recovery and angiogenesis precise uh, until day 21 to day 28. And then we dissected the ischemic side of the muscles for flex analysis to look at uh, all the fibroblast linear traced population and the uh, native endocytic cell population. So as shown in figure 1A, as shown in figure A that um, from day 0 to day 21, we saw an increased IEC population as shown in the top right quadrant. And then as shown figure D, the quantification suggests that there's increased IEC population uh, during the ischemic recovery. And also important, as shown uh, in the uh, immunohistochemistry staining uh, in the bottom uh, right, um, at day 21, uh, we saw there is uh, YIP positive cells localized in the vessel-like structures and co-localized with CD144 uh, signals, which was not seen in the quiescent, suggesting that the trans differentiation of fibroblast to IECs could promote hand limb recovery. Um, to further examine whether in the immune and uh, kappa B signaling plays a role in the vascular regeneration, uh, we used a fibroblast specific kappa B rela knockout mice. So, uh, and we tested matrixal plug assay and the Helen ischemia in those mice. Uh, as shown in figure A, the uh, fibroblast specific RELA knockout um, significantly impaired androgenesis in matrixal. Uh, and also, these mice has impaired blood um, flow recovery, uh, as shown in figure C, and then worsened clinical symptoms as shown in figure D, suggesting sure. that the fibroblast specific map kappa B signaling uh, is very critical for vascular regeneration. Shu, if I could ask you just a quick question. Uh, in panel Hi. A, you're, you're looking at matrix gel plugs that have been uh, in, injected into um, the wild type animal uh, versus that uh, animal, the flox flox animal, which is where, where NF kappa B signaling is knocked out, inflammatory signaling is knocked out, or at least one of the important um, mediators of inflammatory signaling. And uh, it's a rather dramatic impairment of um, angiogenesis, it, it seems, because I guess the, uh, the more pale the uh, nodule, the less blood vessels in that nodule, correct? Right, right, right. And um, so um, what, what kinds of things could be going on there uh, in, in addition to Transdifferentiation of fibroblast endothelial cells uh, contributing to that capillary formation. What other, what other things under the governance of NF kappa B under inflammatory signaling could be going on there? Uh, so there are other cells that is heavily influenced by NF kappa B signaling. Uh, so here we use since we use fibroblast specific uh, round of knockout. So we think the effect is majorly due to. Uh, fibroblast 
and impaired fibroblast trans differentiation and migration into the matrix gel. Uh, but however, with this effect, the impaired fibroblast migration uh, and trans differentiation, we assume that there is decreased androgenic cytokine, which also uh, impaired other cell type to migrate into the matrix gel. But I think those are kind of like a subsequent effect of the fibroblast. Okay, so this work does suggest that fibroblast transdifferentiation to endothelial cells happens and it and plays an important role in the angiogenic response to ischemia, to poor blood flow. Right, right, right. So, and uh, to further understand the transcriptional profile and to identify the subpopulations of the tissue resonant fibroblast, we perform single cell RNA seq. Uh, we isolated the YP positive population uh, from day zero and uh, day 28 after the Hanlon ischemia uh, to compare their transcriptional profile. And as shown here, uh, we importantly, we identified eight distinct uh, subclusters of fibroblast. And importantly, at day 28, where the uh, regeneration almost, uh, almost finished, uh, we saw that uh, cluster 8 and the cluster 5 are dominant in the, in the uh, YIP population. So uh, when we performed uh, pathway enrichment, we found that both populations are highly enriched in endothelial cell-related pathways, such as angiogenesis on vascular regeneration. Uh, so we further performed um, a gene expression analysis and also functional analysis to suggest that the cluster 5 are the transdifferent IECs, which also already acquired a nocilla phenotype as they can form tubes on matrix gel, while the cluster 8 seems to be a angiogenesis supporting fibroblast population as they secrete large amount of angiogenic cytokines. You know, this looks a lot like the palette that uh, Dr. Frango Yanis was looking at that was telling us about earlier. Um, the, um, I guess it go, it's worth saying, uh, uh, Shu, that th this uh, uh, palette that you see of colors is, uh, is a way of looking at the transcriptional profiles of the fibroblasts that are in that ischemic limb, correct? I mean, you can, you can actually subset the fibroblasts into here eight different uh, categories uh, based on the genes they're expressing. Is that correct? Right, right. Yeah. And you found uh, one uh, subset that seems to be able to transdifferentiate into endothelial cells that at least expresses a lot of endothelial genes and another subset that's making androgenic cytokines that could support the uh, growth of blood vessels. Right, right. So, um, so this work, I think we uh, found that fibroblast can transdifferentiate into endothelial cells, uh, at least in the um, nitrate gel plug and handle ischemia model. And also we think the subsides of tissue fibroblast contributes um, to the angiogenic response. And the ischemic expansion of these subsides is due to inner immune signaling and contributes to recovery of perfusion and preservation of ischemic tissue. So. Nice presentation, uh, Dr. Meng. Doc, Dr. Fungo Yanis, I'd be interested in your reaction to this presentation. You might be on mute. We yes, um, I, I think uh, it's uh, truly a great study. So it shows uh, how you can uh, outweigh the limitations of one approach, lineage tracing, by adding cutting edge technology from a different perspective. So the single cell RNA-seq. So um, the use of uh, uh, the fibrous specific protein one pre driver has its limitations uh, in terms of uh, uh, identifying uh, fibroblasts. Uh, even uh, uh, without committing to these cells as being fibroblast, because uh, despite its name, FSP1 uh, is expressed uh, by myeloid cells, uh, it also by vascular cells. So uh, some endothelial cells and uh, uh, smooth muscle cells can express uh, FSP1. Even without this information, one could still have suggested that uh, uh, there is a population of FSP1 positive interstitial cells that uh, become an, uh, angiogenic uh, cells, and that would have been fine. I think what uh, strengthens this tremendously is uh, the uh, concurrent use of uh, single cell transcriptomics. Uh, uh, so combining both 
together, so uh, showing by single cell transcriptomics that there is a cluster of fibroblasts with angiogenic properties, uh, supports further this notion, this concept. The key question here from the viewpoint of um, how this contributes to and how to what extent this contributes to angiogenesis is uh, what is the relative contribution of uh, these cells. Uh, there are a lot of uh, endothelial cells generated, angiogenic endothelial cells, a large number of them in uh, the skeletal muscle. Is the majority of them derived from a fibroblast population or is it an important minority? Um, but that would have required uh, uh, using a range of uh, free drivers and um, uh, looking at a different question than what uh, this study uh, was uh, really designed to do. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a really a great uh, example on uh, how you can use uh, two different technologies uh, to uh, examine an important question and supports the notion of uh, cellular plasticity there has been also there has been another uh, paper by uh, Pampi Young's uh, uh, group in Nature Communications uh, without using lineage tracing, but again uh, suggesting that there is a, a subpopulation of FSP1 positive fibroblasts with angiogenic properties, uh, more in terms of mediator expression rather than uh, uh, being able to convert into uh, fibroblasts. But mm -hmm. I think there is more and more convincing evidence to suggest that uh, the cells that we call fibroblasts may contribute uh, to angiogenesis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Great uh, comment. Um, I'd like to turn to Lily's talk in just a moment, but there, are, there have been quite a few questions coming in. Maybe we can just take one um, of these questions. It relates to um, the role of inflammation and regeneration, and you know, is there, a, is there an optimal zone of, of uh, uh, NF-kappa-B activation? Uh, is there an optimal zone of uh, inflammatory signaling? Shu, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, yeah, I think our lab's work definitely show that there's a Goldilocks zone. I think uh, our previous publications uh, from Palash work has suggested that the uh, we we need optimal in, in the immune activation mm -hmm. for the um, cell plasticity. Uh, too little and too much definitely uh, or hinder the nuclear reprogramming process, such mm -hmm. as trans differentiation or nuclear reprogramming duplopotency. Um, I think in vivo, uh, definitely it, it, it definitely is, it has the same concept there um, because the impairment of even immune signaling definitely hinders uh, regeneration both in the handling ischemia model and also in myocardial infection model. Um, there's a lot of studies support that. And uh, excessive inflammation uh, such as chronic inflammatory uh, signaling um, conditions um, such as diabetes and uh, hyperlipidemia. Uh, these also uh, has impaired uh, regeneration phenotype. Mm -hmm. So I think um, definitely the inner immune is required for the regeneration, but we definitely need the optimal dose for inner immune activation. We don't want to excessively mm -hmm. activate. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shu. Um, let's move on to Lily's uh, contribution to this arena. As I mentioned before, uh, Dr. Lee Lai is an instructor at Houston Methodist Research Institute and uh, has found something quite interesting about uh, the importance of metabolism in transdifferentiation. Uh, Lily, we're coming actually to the end of the hour, so uh, if you could, uh, uh, maybe would it be okay if we went to your concept slide because that kind of summarized nicely uh, the work that you've done. Would that be all right? Can we go to that? Uh, yes, yes. Let's, let's go to the concept slide uh, that basically summarizes all of your work uh, in vitro and in vivo uh, with metabolism and um, mm -hmm. transdifferentiation. Take us through this slide. Uh, so uh, in my study, I, uh, I'm looking into the role of metabolism in the transdifferentiation. And uh, what I found is um, uh, by using our in vitro transdifferentiation protocol, I found that there is a um, glycolytic switch during the transdifferentiation. And this uh, switch happened very quickly um, just after the treatment of poly-IC uh, and uh, the inamu activation. 
And uh, on the other side, in the mitochondria, um, uh, by using the targeted metabol metabolomics, we found uh, there is one um, metabolic intermediates uh, citrate accumulation after the poly IC treatment. And uh, uh, the transporter of the citrate, citrate uh, out, of the, uh, out of the mitochondria, SLC25A1, has been um, uh, increased after poly IC treatment. And uh, then um, the, uh, this phenomenon suggests that the citrate has been transported out of mitochondria. Um, and uh, uh, where did this increased uh, citrate go? And it can go into nuclear and, and it also can go into cytoplasm. If it goes uh, into the cytoplasm, it will contribute to the fatty acid synthesis. And if it goes into nuclear, it can contribute to the um, uh, uh, generation of acetyl-CoA by the ACL, which is the uh, acetyl um, uh, the um, enzyme that convert as a citrate as a uh, CoA, and uh, what I found is um, the level of ACL enzyme uh, is exclusively increased in nuclear, other than the cytoplasm uh, portion of the cells, indicating this uh, increased citrate goes into the nuclear, and uh, also by my following um, um, uh, studies, I further. Uh, confirmed that the uh, acid coa level increased and uh, also the histone acylation levels of uh, some key, key histone proteins has increased, which um, shows uh, uh, it, that uh, this glycolytic switch along with the uh, increase in c uh, citrate uh, and uh, the expo exportation of citrate into nuclear can help with the histone acylation and also the epigenetic plasticity and further uh, facilitate the transdifferentiation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lily. When, when you did this, this work, you've, I, th I believe you showed in vitro and in animals that mm -hmm. yes. if you could block elements of this pathway, you could also block transdifferentiation. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I used uh, uh, different um, commercially available inhibitors of glycolysis or enhancers of glycolysis uh, during the in vivo uh, model of metrogel plaque assay. And what we found is if I use uh, glyco glycolysis enhancers, uh, this transdifferentiation efficiency can, goes, uh, can uh, increase. And if we use the inhibitors of the glycolysis, this efficiency will be impaired. Thank Further, you. Uh, show, uh, confirm that the uh, uh, the glycolytic switch is uh, required for the transdifferentiation. Thanks, Lily. Um, Dr. Franco Giannis, in, in addition to being an outstanding scientist uh, doing great work in cardiac regeneration, you're a doctor. Um, what have we learned here today that could potentially be useful to our patients in the future? Um, what, what therapeutic directions are going to be available to us? What avenues of treatment will open up with th these insights? I think what uh, uh, we learned uh, is that uh, there is hope uh, to be able to transform uh, uh, certain cell types to other cell types. So if um, you're looking uh, in particular in uh, ischemic uh, conditions, in uh, uh, ischemic conditions affecting uh, uh, several organs, uh, the skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle. Um, uh, angiogenesis is generally desirable, uh, whereas uh, fibrosis is undesirable. So if uh, you can reprogram uh, fibroblasts uh, to become uh, endothelial cells uh, and uh, with uh, insights into the mechanisms uh, of uh, this transformation, you could potentially do that by activating just the right innate immune signaling pathways, then uh, perhaps uh, this uh, could trigger uh, a conversion of the cells which are uh, normally designed to produce matrix into cells that can uh, produce new vessels and uh, thus improve uh, perfusion. Um, obviously, a concept uh, is far from implementation and there can be many, many problems uh, while attempting to uh, implement uh, uh, a concept. But uh, 
I think uh, this is a very good start. This is a, a great uh, start, mm -hmm. not in the sense of remuscularizing the entire heart, but uh, in terms of uh, reproducing a cellular response that is desirable in ischemic disease. I would agree with you, Dr. Frangionis. Uh, on, that, on that hopeful note, I think we'll conclude uh, this presentation. I want to thank you, Dr. Frangionis, for joining us uh, from New York, and I uh, appreciate your insights. Also, I'd like to thank my junior colleagues, uh, Drs. Li Lai and Chu Meng, for beautiful presentations. Uh, thank you all, and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks all to everyone uh, for joining us at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences.